right. Our next speaker is Joshua Bengio. Again, someone who I don't think I really need to introduce, but since I'm here and I'm supposed to, I guess I will do it. Um, he got his PhD in computer science from McGill. Uh, he's professor of computer science and operations research at the University of Montreal and a Canada chair, uh, Canada research chair on statistical learning algorithms. He's the author of over 200 publications with over 75,000 citations, co-creator and general chair of the International Conference on Learning and Representations. Um, he was in, he's been inspired by and trained again by the likes of Jeff Hinton, Jan LeCun, and Michael Jordan. He's been central to the development and the explosion of work on and the success of deep learning. Um, his paper with Jan LeCun on deep learning has been cited over 9,000 times. He's known for his contributions such as curricular learning and general adversarial networks. Um, he's been instrumental in bringing connectionism from principles and parlor tricks to practice, from toy models of semantics and family relations to cars that are starting to drive themselves. But I think what is most impressive, at least to me, is that he's done all of this while remaining within the folds of academia. And I don't think I have to sort of elaborate on that point. Um, I really greatly admire him for that. I think he stands as a model for the kinds of scientists I'd like to see um, of the future, um, as I believe that academia is still and will continue to be the best place for real deep learning. So with that, I will introduce you. Yeah, sure. yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, thanks for the organizers uh, to have brought me here and uh, witnessed something that we don't see very often, uh, a meeting of the minds from these different communities. Um, so I'm really, really glad that, glad that this is happening. Um, for those who uh, are interested in learning more about deep learning, uh, with my co-authors, I wrote a book called Deep Learning that came out last December. Um, and that's meant to help um, people with uh, some undergrad math and, and computer science uh, get into the field or understand it or, or use it, and, and apparently it's, it's selling a lot. Um, I want to thank a number of people, but we have a little bug here. Um, so I'm going to tell you uh, later about some work that I've been doing with several collaborators in the last couple of years, trying to bring backprop uh, closer to the brain. So uh, in particular, Benjamin Cellier, Walter Sen, Joan Sacramento, Asia Fisher, Thomas Menard, Dong Yun Lee, Alexa Bilyanyuk, and Jonathan Binas, who's here. And of course, uh, I want to thank uh, Jeff Hinton, who's been really an inspiration for much of that uh, work and a lot of other work I've done. So, um, before I start, let me, um, let me say something important regarding uh, the kind of work I want to do and, and how I think it, it relates to the goals of this conference. So we're trying to understand the brain, all of us here, I think. And there are many ways in which we can uh, uh, relate to this question of understanding and th and the way that I like is uh, you know when I understand something I can I can explain it to someone else in a, in a compact way right so that's that's what I mean by understanding uh, that's the kind of understanding that we have in physics with fairly simple physical laws and of course if you consider physics the full description of you know how things are happening in the world is is incredibly more complex than the physical laws that underpin it. And uh, the thing that I'm interested in is really discovering these kinds of, of compact descriptions that help us understand human and machine or, and animal intelligence. Um, so in machine learning, we can bring something to this uh, exploration. Um, basically, we're looking at such principles and testing them by running experiments with machines, not with people or animals, uh, trying to see if those principles em embedded into algorithms and, and specific uh, software implementations can solve difficult tasks, can learn complex tasks. Um, the thing that I'm going to tell you a little bit about later uh, is also important if we want to see if those principles relate to how humans become intelligent. We need to validate those kinds of ideas uh, with uh, neuroscience and biology, and I think you know, it'd be nice if we had more of that, of course. 
Okay. Um, let me spend a little time to uh, talk about neural nets and what brought me to this field in, the, in around 1985, uh, uh, which was connectionism, because a lot of what I'm doing and a lot of what's the success of today's deep learning owes to the ideas that came out in those days. So I've tried actually to do a one sentence uh, description of the main uh, lessons that I drew from connectionism from the 80s. Um, so it's about uh, iteratively learning distributed representations through a composition of neurally inspired simple operations, so these are what the neurons, the, the abstract neurons are supposed to be doing, towards a justifiable training objective. This is something that I really think is quite important, that the whole system is optimized with respect to something, such that the learner is forced to capture the relevant statistical structure of the data. So that's connecting to maybe higher level goals about understanding the world and, and probability um, as an important tool to do that. Now, um, let me say a few words about um, one of the things that really makes neural nets uh, work, and that is uh, distributed representations and, and depth, so the multiple levels. Uh, there is now uh, a number of papers, several from my group, which uh, produce mathematical and empirical evidence that these two aspects can provide an exponential advantage in terms of uh, ability to generalize or ability to represent functions compactly uh, compared to machine learning approaches or, or uh, even you know, uh, other kinds of approaches uh, that uh, don't uh, exploit these, uh, these kinds of assumptions. Because basically, one thing that is important to understand about uh, machine learning is that you can't get generalization if you don't make any assumptions about your data. And, and humans are learning machines, and so they are making assumptions about the world, and these assumptions somehow are embedded in, you know, in our um, um, genetic material and, and the construction of our brain even before we were born. And so a lot of what we're trying to do in machine learning is come up with uh, a, a way to formalize those assumptions. Maybe it's in the form of architectures, Maybe it's in the form of the, the training framework. Uh, it can come in different forms. It doesn't have to be always uh, very uh, explicit. But um, at the end of the day, um, this is you know, what distinguishes a successful algorithm from another. And of course, also the computational aspects um, that, um, that we just heard about uh, of limited resources is something that, that comes into the matter. Now, in particular, here I want to mention something interesting, which is that if you think about these, these deep neural nets and, and the kinds of things you're computing, uh, if, you, if you cut through the middle and you look at some uh, hidden layer and you think about what each neuron is computing as a feature, um, and what you get with that representation is a description of the input space, which is very, very rich. That's, that's the key with distributed representations, that they can represent an exponentially large space of configurations of the inputs. But what makes it possible to generalize very well is that you can learn from, uh, about this exponentially large space of possible configurations with a, a number of parameters and, and thus a number of, of training examples, which doesn't scale exponentially, but scales linearly with the number of, of these features. And, and that's one thing that distinguishes neural nets, and especially the deep ones, um, from, say, non -parametric, more classical non-parametric methods. Uh, one example of this, actually, uh, that has been uh, seen practically, I mean, uh, in, in experiments, is uh, from the work of uh, uh, Torelba's uh, group, where they've tried to characterize what a, a deep convolutional net trained on uh, recognizing places had learned in its uh, hidden units. And you find units that uh, specialize on, you know, have discovered the notion of people or lighting or ta tables, at least as far as their visual appearance is concerned. Uh, even though these concepts were never uh, shown or in terms of as labels um, by the system. So somehow, um, these, these features actually correspond to um, uh, meaningful concepts, at least at some level. 
So one question I, ask, I, I get asked a lot is, so what's new with neural nets with uh, you know, deep learning and, and, and this century? Uh, and of course, one important aspect is we, can, we have tricks now to train these networks, um, even though they are deeper than what we were able to do in the 90s. Um, and it turns out that one of the tricks, um, and very few people know about this, uh, actually came from work um, we did inspired by biology. So my student, Xavier Gloreau, wanted to explore uh, a nonlinearity for neural nets, which was closer to biology. And of course, these kinds of uh, rectifying nonlinearity uh, had been used for a long time uh, by a biologist. But it turned out that when you, you stick them in these uh, deep uh, multi-layer networks, uh, it just makes training much easier. And they have now become a standard that really um, you know, there are some variations now, but it's, it's really important. Um, another example of inspiration that came probably from biology, uh, I assume, because it came from Jeff Hinton, is this injection of a noise inside the network, uh, what we call dropout, which has some similarity to um, spiking uh, and helps to regularize and make these networks more robust. Um, another thing which has seen a lot of progress in this century compared to the previous one, is unsupervised learning. Uh, Jeff, uh, I'm sorry, Jan uh, Lecam talked a lot about this, and he uh, in introduced GANs, the generative adversarial networks, which, which, uh, on which there's a lot of work recently. So I'm not going to go through this, but the, you know, if you have the idea that uh, neural nets are just uh, pattern classification uh, machines, uh, you know things have changed and they can generate these kinds of images uh, so they can you know, creatively uh, produce a diversity of images, sounds, texts, and so on. That's quite impressive. Although I would say, as, as Jan was saying, we're far from having nailed that particular problem. Um, another thing I want to mention that's connected to unsupervised learning, and um, I, I put these slides because I feel like uh, in, in the talks that I heard here, this notion wasn't necessarily uh, compatible with, with, with what I heard. Um, the notion of disentangling factors of variation, something that I've been discussing a lot in, in the last decade. Um, when we're trying to learn representations, so what is our you know, neural net learning in its hidden layers, or what it should be learning, and, and what kind of representations you know, our brain uh, learning, um, you know, there's the question of what makes a good representation. And of course, for, for many decades, uh, we, we've, we've known that good representations, useful representations, would be ones that somehow uh, would be invariant to the things we don't care about and, and only sensitive to the things we care about. But, but the problem is, if you consider like a learning agent, like a human or, or an animal, um, or a robot that's going to have a very long life, um, it's hard to know ahead of time you know, what the future will bring us. And so, if you're not sure what the future task will be, then you should, you know, as a safeguard, instead of throwing away a lot of information that currently you don't need, you should try to be a little bit more conservative and just separate the different aspects of the world, uh, some of which may be relevant now and others might be relevant, relevant later. So this is the idea that uh, we don't want to necessarily compress information and, and eliminate what we consider now to be noise, but rather to separate the different aspects that explain uh, what we're seeing, the causal factors, ideally. And if you're able to do that, then you can, you can really uh, uh, considerably reduce or even eliminate the, what's called the curse of dimensionality that makes statistics difficult in high dimensions. Um, and it, it really makes it easy for a learner, what it, once it has discovered those factors, to, um, to learn a new task uh, and, and you know, to, to essentially just select the, the factors that are important and even do things that, th that seem crazy, like uh, learning from zero examples, but I won't go and explain that. Um, another thing that's changed is uh, that's related to, to the idea that neural nets are not anymore just uh, processing vectors to do classification, um, is the introduction of attention mechanisms in neural nets. This is really, really something that's changing how we do machine learning these days. Um, so attention is, is, in principle, very simple. It's about gating uh, some computation and, and uh, maybe selecting some, as some computation uh, to focus on, on aspects of, uh, of the data or of the uh, elements in our representations. 
And we introduced this in the context of trying to crack the problem of uh, machine translation using neural nets uh, a, a few years ago. And we introduced a particular form of attention, which we call a content-based soft attention, which has turned out to work really, really well, in which um, the uh, translation uh, neural net uh, will generate one word at a time in, in the uh, output language, say it's going to produce one word in English, one after the other. But as it does that sequentially, uh, it's allowed to look in the input sentence or its representation, its semantic representation, which has been extracted by some other recurrent net, and to focus its attention on one or a few words. And this ability to just, you know, eliminate from the, the, the processing most of the input sort of uh, just makes it much easier to do some tasks. And it, it, it was night and day when we introduced this thing into the systems. And, uh, you know, in, in a few months, we went from really bad systems to state-of-the-art systems. And a year and a half later, Google put that in there. Google Translate, and of course, there's a lot of other complex engineering tricks and, and other nice things that have been added. But, but now, if you look at how machine translation was a couple of years ago with n-grams compared to uh, sort of how human translate according to human evaluations, the current neural nets have more than half sort of the distance between the old systems and, and human translation. So this is something pretty important. And of course, it's, it's allowing neural nets now to process not just images and fixed size vectors, but any, uh, any data structure, uh, anything that can be represented by some uh, graph by some uh, list by some tree in any, any kind of data structure uh, set you know we can we can use these things as input we can produce these things as output using attention mechanisms um, and and this kind of technique has also been used and I think this is also a very important change from what we've seen in, in, in the past uh, to augment these neural nets with a memory so in other words uh, you can think of it like we, we have a piece of network which is like cortex-like, which you can think maybe as a controller and, and something that represents information um, and, uh, and combine that with something, say maybe hippocampus-like, that's going to allow you to do one-shot storage and represent memory uh, that can be stored quickly and, 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 and then we can use attention to decide what to write where and what to read where. I mean, where to read. Um, and, um, and again, we can learn, you know, uh, where to put attention given the context. So depending on w the state of the system, uh, those networks can learn to attend to what's most relevant to the current state of the system. And, and once you see this, you can also see how this can be used to reason, at least in the neural net sense. So we're not talking about reasoning in the a classical AI logical modus ponens sense. Um, we're just saying what we mean by reasoning here is that the network will sequentially combine pieces of information and through learning it figures out you know what's the right way of combining these pieces of information so depending on the tasks it will learn to do modus ponens or it will learn to do other kinds of, of reasoning that we know exist and humans do for example and this has been used for uh, question answering tasks as an example all right um, so to put uh, what I'm talking about in the perspective uh, that Josh Tenenbaum introduced at the beginning of this conference, uh, neural nets are somewhere in between brain implementations and, and cognition. Um, and uh, there's a lot that could be said about how uh, you know, they can move up or move down depending on, on the kind of investigations we're looking at. Uh, some of the things I've talked about, how attention can you know, help us deal with data structures to uh, uh, learn to access memory, to reason. Uh, I haven't talked much about language and semantics, but it's also uh, highly uh, related. At the end of this presentation, I'll say a few words about a, a current project which involves uh, representation and um, the notions of objects and causality, which I think relate a lot to uh, cognition. And, uh, but for the most part, uh, I, I'm going to tell you about some work that I've been doing about that's moving down closer to biology, uh, about how backprop could be um, a potentially implemented by brains. So, um, so backprop. Uh, um, Blake Richards uh, said it all, so I don't need to repeat these things. Uh, he gave a, a really great introduction to this subject and, and has amazing new ideas that I, I just 
die to read the paper for understanding better. Um, but uh, so some of the key points to, to get from that is uh, the thing that really works in the applications of deep learning is this idea of end-to-end -end training, where we, we have a big complicated system with many modules, with attention, with memory, with uh, different pieces that talk to each other. But they're all trained together with respect to this one common objective. Sometimes there's a, a game theoretical thing, like in GANs, where you have different modules have different objectives. But even in that case, we can you know, have an interpretation that it, it sort of makes sense mathematically to do that. So, um, and even in that case, we have backprop being used to, to, to do credit assignment, so to propagate information about how things should change in various places in the system. Problem is, oh, and by the way, and backprop is not just used for supervised learning, it's used for reinforcement learning, it's used for unsupervised learning, generative models, so it's everywhere right now in deep learning. Um, problem is, um, you know, how, how could it possibly be implemented by brains? Um, in some of the questions, uh, like, you know, how would be the equivalent of the backpropagation equations be implemented? Uh, and one thing that I'll mention is there's one issue, which is if you look at those equations, they're actually linear propagation. So, of course, there's nonlinearity involved, but in terms of the errors, the errors at the next layer are um, a, a, a linear function of uh, the error at the layer uh, downstream. Um, and it's not clear how neurons could do that. Uh, uh, linear that kind of linear computation and whether there should be like a separate network doing this and, and as Blake was saying you know how is it gonna synchronize its weights to match the the, the main network so that there's all kinds of questions um, that are um, open um, so here I just list a few papers and current work uh, in that line of thought uh, that I, I'm involved in um, and uh, I'm not going to go through all of these things, but I'm going to, you know, uh, sample some of the ideas in, in some, uh, several of these papers. Um, so this is just for reference. Um, so one of the first papers uh, we did was trying to connect um, SDP to something a little bit more amenable to uh, the kinds of things we do with uh, neural nets. So it, it turns out that if you um, have weight changes that are proportional to a presynaptic times a postsynaptic term, where so the rho, rho here is a firing rate and S is the, the, the voltage potential or the equivalent. Um, and, uh, and so if we take the rate of change on the postsynaptic side times the firing rate on the, on the presynaptic side, uh, we, we get weight updates that uh, end up looking like uh, the STDP, uh, the signature of STDP, um, if of course you, you, you put in spikes on top of these rates. Um, so that's, that's one, that was one starting point um, which, which sort of uh, stimulated uh, the next piece of work which was about, uh, I, I, I think one of the key ideas here which is that if you, if you have um, a network that has both feed forward and feedback connections and and here i'm going to assume that the the feed forward and the feedback connections are symmetric so it's a it's a recurrent net um and uh and you let it settle to a fixed point and later i'll tell you that we can get rid of that assumption um so if you clamp the input is going to produce some outputs and now there's something interesting that happens if you nudge the outputs a little bit in the direction corresponding to a better answer. In other words, you're, you, you now know the right answer, and instead of clamping it on the outputs, you're just pushing a little bit the outputs towards the right answer. So this creates a perturbation to the fixed point. And then if you study how that perturbation propagates down the layers, it, it, uh, it looks like backcrop. There's some scaling issues, but it, it, it has essentially the same properties as backdrop. So this was a kind of starting point. Uh, and when we did this paper, we considered that this, uh, these fixed point uh, computation, we could think of uh, inference. In fact, if instead of just running the deterministic dynamics, we consider adding noise to this, uh, then this uh, approximates a particular form of Monte Carlo Markov chain. Um, and the important thing to have in mind here also um, in, in the later work is the way we conceive the dynamics, at least it's a convenient way to think about that um, 
uh, it corresponds to minimizing some energy function. And so here, the, the state of the system is just evolving by gradient descent on the energy plus some noise. Um, so, so you can study both deterministic systems and then uh, we're interest, interested in uh, those fixed points corresponding to where the energy derivative with respect to the state is zero. So S dot here is a temporal derivative. Uh, so fixed point means ds dt equals zero, but we also want that to correspond to a minimum of some energy function. And, and you, can, you can generalize these kinds of notions to stochastic units. Uh, and some of the theorems we've worked out have the stochastic version, where now um, you don't actually get to a minimum, but you get to a stationary distribution, which just corresponds to the Boltzmann distribution of this energy function, which just means that uh, if you wait long enough, then the state distribution is as a probability proportional to e to the minus energy, which is uh, just a, a stochastic version of the deterministic thing. Okay, so, so one way to think about this nudging idea that uh, got us some mileage and, and the latest paper we published on this, uh, which we call equilibrium propagation, um, is that um, um, we're going to change the energy function. So instead of clamping like we do in, in Boltzmann machines or contrasted Hebbian learning, instead of clamping the outputs uh, and having these two modes or two phases, um, we are still gonna have these two phases, but in, in the phase where we get to see the answer, uh, we're just gonna change the energy function so that we're gonna pay a small price, uh, beta times the cost of our prediction compared to uh, whatever the target was. So that's the, uh, the beta here is a small scalar, a small positive scalar uh, in the nudging phase, but it would be zero in, in the prediction phase. So you could imagine we have some network with recurrence and then the outside world you know, imposes some constraints or nudging uh, when the information is revealed. So, uh, so we came up with this uh, theorem, um, mostly the work of uh, Benjamin Cellier, um, that ends up telling us how we should change the weights. So don't, don't worry about the notation, I'm gonna explain this, but, but essentially, we end up with um, an equation that tells us what's the true gradient of the cost function, the thing that we're trying to minimize, which maybe is like prediction error, but it could be any objective function that, for which we, we know how to compute derivatives with respect to the output. And, and we end up with um, an equation that says, well, we should consider small perturbations, small beta, small nudging. And so in the limit of these small nudging, uh, we're gonna just compare the derivative of the energy with respect to the parameters which are what we call sufficient statistics, so the same kind of thing we see in both machines. Um, in, in both uh, situations, one corresponding to the fixed point achieved when the network is allowed to relax and produce its answer, and one when we also impose a little bit of nudging towards the right answer. So we have these two forms, and uh, we take the difference between those two, and that gives us the gradient. And there is a stochastic version of this. All right, so that's interesting, but there are ma still many things that are not biologically plausible in this formulation. Um, um, first of all, how does that relate to things like SEDP? Well, if you choose a particular um, energy function which looks a lot like the Hopfield energy function, then you end up with uh, weight updates which are essentially the same as what I had before, except they are symmetrized. So, uh, uh, if you had a way to make the, the feed forward and the feedback weights agree with each other, then you would get these kinds of updates. Um, and you're able to train neural nets, uh, these kinds of neural nets with feedback connections using these, this rule. The, the one most bothering problem with this particular approach uh, is that we have to really wait to get close to the fixed point. So it might take like hundreds of time steps of, of simulations here uh, before we are allowing the network to do an update of the weights. Otherwise, the gradient is not correct and, and it doesn't learn well. And, and, and also that this um, depends on how many layers you have and, and somehow for, longer, for deeper networks it gets um, it takes more and more time to, uh, you know, enough precision in, in converging to the fixed point. So, so these are uh, 
uh, sort of nagging problems that I'll, I'll, we're trying to fix now and I'll tell you about in a few minutes. Um, another issue, so, so related to this issue of um, uh, it takes a lot of time to converge to a fixed point, we investigated a particular kind of energy function, which I call the feedforward energy function. And it's not really a new uh, kind of energy function uh, or something that, something that people have studied in uh, different guises. Um, so it's just an energy function that says that uh, what we really want to have at the end of the day is the result of a feedforward computation. Right? So if you, if you minimize this, well, the minimum is when the state at level k is uh, weighted sum of the firing rates uh, corresponding to level k minus 1. So that's just the usual feedforward computation. In other words, if uh, we had an implementation that was just doing feedforward computation, um, in one pass, it would achieve the uh, fixed point, uh, at least in the um, prediction phase. Um, now, there is there's some issues with this. So that's really nice, because we get you know, convergence, immediate convergence, and, and also that allows us to connect with traditional neural nets. Uh, and so you, maybe you're going to ask me, well, so what happened with the feedback connections? Well, they're still there, but they're sort of implicit in the energy function. So in, in the previous energy functions I showed you, we had WIG and WGI. We had feedforward weights and feedback weights, and they had to be symmetric and so on. Now, what we have is that uh, if you take the derivative of the energy function, you have two kinds of terms, and they correspond to the feedforward computation and the feedback computation. And uh, the feedforward part of the energy function, uh, we, we can just recognize when we set that to zero, we get the, we get the normal feedforward equations. And, and for the second term, you notice that um, if the first term is zero, in other words, if we, uh, if, we are, if we have set the activity according to the feedforward computation, the second term vanishes. Um, so in the feedforward situation, uh, the feedback will somehow magically cancel if, if we were to follow that derivative. But of course, the question is, how would a, a biological implementation do those computations? The, the, the feedforward thing is, is the usual neural computation. It's not clear how to do the other one there. So that's one thing I'll, I'm going to be telling you about. Um, yes. Um, yeah, as I said, um, the, that uh, energy function yeah, can, leads to one pass convergence at prediction time. And uh, if there is no nudging, then um, um, then the the, uh, the 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 second term, the feedback term, cancels, um, and um, and then there's something even more magical that happens, which is that in the um, the gradient formula from equilibrium propagation, we have these two terms, one one which is in the prediction phase and one which is in the nudging phase. And uh, it turns out that um, um, with these kinds of energy functions in the um, prediction phase with beta equals zero, um, the first term um, cancels, becomes zero. And so the, um, the only thing that remains is the... Um, in the, in the sufficient statistic that we, we need for our update is the second term, which comes in the nudging phase, which essentially, if, we, if we, we're going we're gonna to see, corresponds to implementing backprop. So, um, so what this is saying is maybe we don't need to have two phases. Maybe uh, we can be uh, having a system that's continuously making predictions and getting feedback at the same time. And we don't need to have this alternation between predict get the answer, update, predict, get the answer, update, which is a traditional view that we have with, uh, with backprop and that we had in, in the first formulation. Right, so uh, let's, let's look at this uh, a little bit uh, in, in a bit more detail. Um, if we are uh, near the fixed point solution, uh, so beta is small, um, and we look at the equations um, uh, for, for the uh, derivative of the energy that tells us in which direction the, the uh, neurons are moving. Um, so what we're seeing is 
that we have a term that's pushing each neuron to satisfy the bottom-up input. So it's just saying, you know, the, 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 the previous layer is telling this guy what to do with the usual feedforward uh, kind of computation. And what this guy is doing is saying, aha, well, uh, to ch you should change the layer K so that um, if, if the, the, the guy at the next layer has a discrepancy between its state and, and what you're sending it, then uh, you'd like to help it reduce that discrepancy uh, by moving in this direction, all right? And then if, if you're an output unit, you also get to be nudged towards whatever the outside world wants you to do. Okay, so if we, if we set this equal to zero, um, um, at a point where um, uh, beta is small, then we, we see that these, these errors, the discrepancy between the, um, um, the, the, the state and the bottom-up input into the, 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 the neuron, uh, these errors actually correspond to uh, backpropagated errors. So if you look at this formula and, and you remember something from backprop, it's exactly the formula for backprop. Um, in other words, there is a way to find the solution to uh, the nudged phase, which involves a single downward pass, which only propagates these perturbations. Um, and, and it would compute exactly the same thing as backprop. Okay, now there's a problem here, which is that in this phase where we're just propagating those perturbations from layer K plus one to layer K, we're doing this computation, which is multiplying this error that we have, this perturbation that we have, this discrepancy between the bottom up and top down, really, uh, at the next layer, and then multiplying by the nonlinearity of the, of the, uh, the neuron and multiplying by the transpose of the feedforward weights. And um, so there are several issues here. One is how do we get the transpose of the feedforward weights? And the other is this whole thing is linear in the uh, perturbations at the next level. So how are we going to implement this kind of equation, which is linear computation? So one idea that um, we are working on and seems to, uh, to give interesting results is to use lateral connections to set up a system that will allow to implement this kind of uh, equations. Because, uh, yeah, we, we know, sorry, we know uh, how to implement uh, that part of the updates, but it's not clear, you know, what's the neural implementation of this thing. So how do we do that? Um, so, so the idea that we're exploring is that these E's, these errors, which correspond to the backpropagated errors, um, they're going to correspond to the difference between bottom-up and top-down inputs in pyramidal cells. And um, so the bottom-up we know is just a weighted sum of inputs from the previous layer. So what about the top-down? Well, top-down is actually gonna be the combination of two things. It's gonna be the combination of actual feedback from the next layer and lateral connections from the same layer through interneurons. So I'm gonna show you a picture here that's better. Um, so you have these pyramidal cells, they have bottom-up input, and that's coming, in, coming into the, the basal dendrites. Uh, and they have these uh, epical dendrites um, that Blake told you about. And then uh, we're gonna have two kinds of inputs into the, uh, 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 those dendrites, the direct feedback from the next layer and, and through what I call mirror interneurons, maybe Martinorti cells, uh, feedback from other units and the same unit, but you know, I mean other units on the same layer uh, to the same place. And and so what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be thinking of training those lateral connections so that they are canceling the feedback coming from above. So the network is trying to figure out what the feedback from the next layer is gonna be and learning to cancel it. Why would we wanna do that? Because the only thing that the, this layer can predict about the layer above um, is sort of the normal behavior that doesn't depend on the outside uh, injection of, of uh, of errors, so it's going to try to predict um, the the behavior of the downstream units in the situation where beta equals zero, where there is no uh, error, there is no external signal that comes in. And so, uh, when we combine the the signal from above with the lateral connections, uh, 
if there was no nudging, then this would be zero and there would be no contribution to the learning here. But if there is uh, a, a, an error higher up, then it's going to show up here and potentially produce a signal that can drive the learning here. So that's, that's what we've been experimenting with. And, uh, and we can train MNIST on the two-layer network using this kind of, of thing. Um, but now let me uh, make other connections. Um, so there is an interesting connection between this and some of the ideas that Jeff Hinton proposed in 2007 that Blake already referred to um, that relate those those errors that are being propagated to temporal derivatives of the um, of the activity of the neurons. So, a, so it turns out that if we start from the, the condition where there is no nudging and we consider how these, these errors are going to change over time, well, they will be proportional to those, uh, those propagated gradients that we'd like to see. Uh, so the, 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 the error information is really encoded in the temporal derivative of the uh, activity of the neurons. And um, the other thing, of course, is uh, uh, you know, if we were to follow the backprop rule, what, what kind of update do we want? Well, we want something that's a, a very similar to what I showed you before, except we, we're, we, um, instead of the temporal derivative of the postsynaptic, we have this error. But that error is, is a temporal derivative, right? So this whole thing is the same thing as we had before. So again, this is something that would be naturally implemented by SCTP. Okay, let me say a few words about the weight symmetry, which I sort of uh, mentioned as, as an issue. Um, so again, Blake meant, told about this already, and, and, and he, he told you about feedback alignment, um, experiments suggesting that, well, maybe you don't need to have exact symmetry. In fact, you can fix the weights. Um, I, I, you know, I, I have some doubts about whether this completely solves the problem. I think you, you still want those weights to be approximately close to the transpose or functionally close to, to uh, that computation. Um, but there is something, I think, that can save the day here and will have later uses, uh, which is uh, a set of both experimental results with uh, simulations with denoising on encoders and a set of uh, theoretical results from the, the group of Aurora, which both suggest that if you, if you consider two consecutive layers and you think about the feedforward computation and the feedback computation is together forming an, an autoencoder. And that autoencoder, in our case, has also noise injected in it. Um, then if you, if you try to optimize the weights so that um, you minimize reconstruction error, um, you will often end up with those two set of weights converging to the transpose of each other. All right? Um, so I think this, this is something that needs a, uh, more both theoretical and experimental work, but there is evidence on both sides. So, for example, the theory requires uh, sparsity, which is something reasonable for brains, and, and uh, potentially other assumptions that uh, need to be verified experimentally. But there, there's this paper we put out uh, seven years ago, which uh, shows something like this happening with, with autoencoders. So, that's, so I think there's some hope on this issue of symmetry of the weights. And finally, there's another thing I told you about which was um, that, well, we don't really want, when we, we, we have these dynamical systems, we don't really want to wait for uh, a fixed point before we do an update. We'd really like to have a system that can make updates all the time. And, and so we have a new formulation, uh, and this is work with uh, Walter Sen and uh, the experiments that are being done by Jonathan Benas, who's here, uh, in which, Instead of thinking of the state of the system as the uh, activity of the neurons, we think of the state of the system as jointly the activity and their temporal derivative, so the velocity, uh, something more similar to what we find in, in physics, then um, uh, actually finding the solution of DE, D, this extended state equals zero, becomes very easy. And if you just write this equation, you end up with a relationship between the state and its derivative, which defines the dynamics. In other words, you can give me any dynamics, which is whatever your network uh, does, and uh, I, can, I can come up with an energy function um, that is such that so long as the network computes those dynamics, you, 
you now uh, are always on this particular manifold uh, of the state and its derivative that satisfy this, this equation. And so we can actually apply the equilibrium propagation equations that tell us how to update the weights all the time. We don't have to wait for convergence. And we tried this and it works and it's, it's very stable and it seems to be robust to the depth. So we, we need to do more experiments with that. But uh, the figure shows that, well, the errors go, goes down in some uh, of the experiments we're running pretty quickly, and and also that uh, you know you can change the inputs and the, the nudging targets on the fly, and 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 you can update all the time. And the size of the updates updates might not be the same all the time. These these are the size of the updates, um, uh, but learning works. Okay, so so there's a lot more work to be done. We we want to uh, we want you to test those kinds of theories on real brains. Uh, and and um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not an expert enough in, in biology and neuroscience to, to tell you what the right experiments should be, but there are some pretty obvious things that you know, uh, should be true. For example, uh, well, testing the idea that uh, we are doing something like gradient descent could be uh, uh, observed by checking whether um, after the updates of the weights at the next trial, the, the, some key neurons that was important in the, the behavior uh, should improve in the sense that it's, it's now doing something that, uh, that makes the output closer to the right answer. And if we're able to identify such neurons, then we should be able to see that not only after the next trial, you're getting a, a sort of a more appropriate activity for this neuron, but in addition, uh, in the few, say, 100 millisecond or something on that order of magnitude, uh, after there's been a surprise and learning, you know, due to nudging, um, the, this neuron's activity should also improve. In other words, this is due to the weights changing, and this is due to the activity changing. So the, the, the nudging has as an effect that all the neurons should be moving towards quote unquote better configuration that would give rise to lower error. And this potentially could be something we, we, we would observe uh, if we can make these measurements. Um, this, this theory about having uh, feedback and natural connections um, canceling each other, each other, again, is something that can probably be tested. Uh, for example, if there is no nudging, there is no surprise, uh, then somehow the contribution from the apical dendrite should, should be zero. Um, and if you're able to stimulate those interneurons uh, either to increase their activity or decrease it, then you should be able to see uh, you know, increase or decreased uh, LTP corresponding to that. And I'm sure many more experiments can be devised. All right, so to conclude that part, backprop has been really the workhorse of the amazing successes of deep learning. And it would be great to see if uh, brains can have a functionally equivalent implementation of something that does credit assignment according to similar principles. And it would help us understand how brains can learn more complex tasks, maybe different from the typical tasks that people in, in psychology and, and neuroscience are, are testing, uh, but more like the tasks that uh, machine learning people are, are testing. Um, I, I don't have a lot of time, so let me just uh, move to the last little topic, my last slide, uh, to talk about something now uh, going in the direction of cognition. So I, I've talked mostly about neural nets uh, making contact with uh, brain sciences. Um, so there's also a lot of work in, in our field um, trying to make neural nets do more sort of high level cognition types of uh, computation. And um, in, in my group, the way that we are thinking about this is representations, because uh, as someone said, Representation learning is the heart of what deep learning is about. This is how we called our conference, uh, ICLR, International Conference on Learning Representations. And uh, I don't think that right now we have really satisfying ways of forcing a deep network to learn representations that are more abstract, in other words, that will generalize better, and, and furthermore, that capture causality, in other words, how things in the world are really related to each other. And, um, and so let me tell you a little bit about um, a paper that we put out on archive uh, recently that uh, attempts to go in that direction. So, so um, the objective is to use agent learning, so some kind of reinforcement learning in an environment to help discover better representations that capture uh, something about uh, causality that has to do with uh, maybe affordances like how agents can influence the world 
and, and, and how to use that influence to name things in the world in the sense of uh, uh, setting up appropriate representations. And so so to, uh, to explain that idea, let me, use a, let me use a prop. Okay, so here's an object here, the, the, the control mouse or whatever, the pointer. Um, I just made up a policy to control it. I can move it in space. And I can do it independently of other factors that explain the world around me, right? I could choose to instead of move my phone and not move the, uh, the mouse. So what, what's happening here, why am I telling you this? Because it would be very convenient if my brain had not only the ability to produce this policy that controls this, this particular factor that explains things around me, but also to represent that. And, and I think that we get a, an important clue about good representations that some of the factors that hopefully our brain represents fairly explicitly correspond to aspects of the world that we can control independently. In other words, that we can change, I can change the position of this bottle and not move other things. This is very important because if I'm going to be able to control the world later and I know, you know these building blocks, these factors um, that allow me to control separate aspects of the world, it becomes much easier to come up with policies that combine those building blocks those options, as they're sometimes called, in order to uh, come up with complex policies. Also, those factors are likely to correspond to good explanations about the world. Positions of objects in images, of course, is something important, but instead of hardwiring that notion, as we normally do with supervised learning, what I'm talking about is an objective function, which, of which we, you know, we've tried a few, uh, that is saying, let's train a system that jointly learns policies a family of policies and, 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 and neurons, sort of feature detectors at some level in the network, uh, such that for each feature corresponds a policy, and the policy has the property that it changes that feature and tries to change as little as possible the other features. Right? So it seems to be like a chicken and egg thing because one depends on the other, but that's not unusual in neural nets, right? Like each layer depends on the others and we, 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 can, we can deal with that, and GANs is even worse. Um, and so that's, that's interesting because it, it, it maybe helps to separate out different aspects of the world, uh, so disentangle them, um, and it also uh, connects to higher level notions that people care about in, in, in uh, cognitive science, like objects and attributes and agents. Um, so, so once we start talking about attributes, talking about agents is not very far. I mean, I'm sorry, about objects is not very far. I mean, an, an object is just a, a, a collection of attributes that somehow um, have s something to do with each other. For example, when I move this thing, um, I'm, I'm controlling a, a bunch of attributes together, and, and somehow, you know, if I can control it, maybe I can more easily change some of the attributes. So there's, there's a tight connection between those attributes in the, the sense that the way I can control them is, is, is tightly linked. And then, um, the notion of agent comes because uh, in, in my initial explanation I said, well, those factors correspond to aspects of the world that I can control independently, that I can control. So I'm an agent, right? I'm an entity that can control things in the world. Um, but I could also have factors in my mind uh, that concerns aspects of the world that I can't control, but that you can control. And I, I'd like to model that, right? So now I have to think about other agents and what they could do and uh, even if I don't have access to some of those factors directly, by you know, imagining those, um, those agents doing things and, and executing policies, I can build a better model of the world, which of course children you know, use all the time to control us, right? Um, all right, so, so I think this opens up a bunch of other uh, interesting high-level questions and connects also to natural language, because I believe that uh, uh, Natural language gives other clues about these high-level causal factors. Why is it that we use those words? Why is it that we use those concepts in natural language? Um, they are the things that typically we can we can manipulate, that we can we can act upon. That um, and and so if we want to train machines to understand the world, I'm sure that it'll be easier if we talk to them. That's basically what I'm going to close on. Thank you.